and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Hi, everyone. I would like to introduce you to my guest today. We have an award-winning author on the show, Sonia Grace, and she is an internationally known mystic and healer who offers immediate stability, clarity, and guidance to clients all around the world. For over 30 years, she has helped people who suffer physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. She has a wide variety of talent to choose from in which she accesses her ability to channel and communicate with the divine. She sees and receives messages from loved ones who have crossed over and offers a venue for healing in this world and the spirit world. Her ability to read and clear the karmic threads to past lives helps clients heal lifetimes of patterns. Sonia is also an energy surgeon who defies time and space with her ability to spirit travel to work with her clients where wherever they are in the world. She performs all levels of healing, including restructuring tissue and repairing organs, bones, blood, and cells. She is able to execute all levels of her work from distance and over the phone. And her ancestral background is a fascinating blend of Native American Choctaw and Cherokee descent in Norwegian. She is adopted on the Hopi Reservation, where she is considered a medicine woman. And she is the author of five books. The most recent one we are going to talk about Today that was released, just released, called Dancing with Raven and Bear, a book of earth medicine and animal magic, and I loved it. And Sonia is also featured on Gaia's TV, Great Minds in Ancient Civilizations, as well as Beyond Belief with George Norrie on Coast to Coast AM. And she lives where my dad lives, in Arizona. So Sonia, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> How cool. Well, thank you for having me on the show. And and a big hello from Arizona. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. know it's so much warmer out there than New York. My dad, we talk every week and he's letting me know, you know, the temperature. And I'm like, yep, okay, still raining. And we're about to get six more inches of snow this weekend. I can't believe well, it. <laughs> he, he must be down south because I'm up north and we're like 38 degrees this morning. Oh, um, yes, he yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've been getting tons of snow up north. So we're, we're probably a little bit more aligned with you and your weather. <laughs> yes, yes. He yeah. lives uh, in Glendale, so. Right. He's He's got much warmer weather than us. Yeah. yeah. But it's beautiful here, and I'm really happy to be on the show and talk about Dancing with Raven and Bear. Yeah. So I'd love to a little bit m- know a little bit more of your upbringing and mm-hmm. kind of your journey of becoming or stepping into the healer that you are. And um, I've always been extremely connected uh, to the Native American culture. And um, I've never had my DNA tested, but the rumor has it that uh, we have some Iroquois that runs mm-hmm. through our blood. But um, I, when I tend to go on journeys or uh, shamanic journeys, I always tend to connect with the Native American um, just feeling and spirit and guides and stuff. So I'm really excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excited mm-hmm. to have you on. I'd love to learn more. Great. Great. Well, you know, I, I was born this way. I've, my, my earliest memory is two years old and seeing my guides, uh, the guides that work with me are high angelic beings and they've been with me through all my lifetimes and they, they, um, they were actually standing over me. I was in the crib and I used to roll the crib across the floor and bang on the door and my mom would come in and go, what are you doing? <laughs> and more importantly, how did this little two-year-old move the crib across the floor? Because those cribs were really heavy back in the day. And my guides, I remember seeing them smiling, looking down at me, smiling and moving the crib across the floor. And, you know, there you have it. I, I, I had wild things happen when I was a kid. I mean, just... You know, I could see all the Davic realm. I could see spirits walking through the house. I was doing healing work on our on our Dalmatian when I was five years old. I mean, I I grew up on a farm, so thank God for that because you know it really had me connected to nature and and all of the you know the devas and the tree spirits, everything. I mean, I was I grew up outside. You know, we played outside all the time and. I, I'm, I feel very fortunate for that because it helped me to integrate 
as much as one could integrate being able to see, hear, feel, smell, and oddly sometimes taste everything in the spirit realm. So, you know, my mom not knowing really what to do with me or how how is it, you know, that I'm able to see all this stuff, um, she just decided that I was artistic and <laughs> not autistic, artistic. And she put me in, um, in ballet class when I was five and I trained as a classical ballerina. I danced professionally for about 15 years. Uh, Ten of those years were with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So I had sort of this whole, you know, career and life as a dancer, which is really what I attribute as to what helped me learn about time and space and how to defy time and space. Um, and that, of course, you know, I mean, I'm going over volumes of time here, but, you know, through the course of th working with three teachers through my my life as a healer, I... Um, I really did get to a point after being a hands-on healer for years to being able to work long distance and become the energy surgeon that you, you mentioned earlier. So I, I work on people now totally long distance and I have clients in Australia and New Zealand and Slovenia and Norway and Scotland, England, all over the world. And and it doesn't matter to me. I can put myself in front of someone and, you know, and work on them as if they were right in front of me for real. And that's sort of what I feel is a gift that I have being able to, you know, defy time and space and, and be in front of people. Yeah, that has been one of, I would say, the most interesting as aspects of my learning as well in being an energy healer is when I was able to learn more about consciousness, um, you know, quantum physics that we don't need to touch in, e in order to heal. And I remember one of my teachers said, well, if you if you need to help somebody out that's not feeling well and you have their permission, just go ahead and look in their body, you know. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it was when my dad was sick at the time in Arizona, so that's why I wanted to learn distance healing. I did it through the modes of um, modality of Reiki and I'm like just go look at his body like what do you mean and just set your mm -hmm. intent your intent to go and you know and then I started to learn like wow you know I don't have mm -hmm. to be in front of somebody or physically touching them so and and to add to that because I've been doing this work now for 38 years I I'm I'm a real stickler about you know people having a teacher and really working with someone um, who can guide them and help them really understand um, all, all levels of healing. I, I was trained old school. I was I was trained long before Reiki was around. You know, in in energy medicine, I learned polarity therapy. I learned Traeger. I you know a lot of hands on healing modalities were were the basis of my training. And then I went into um, long distance healing work. Um, very much inspired through Barbara Brennan and, you know, Donna Eden and some of the real pioneers of our industry. I, I don't, I don't, um, I, I caution people because there's so many things that you can maybe, um, not recognize are there if a person is doing healing work and they're not keeping their filters clear. And I'm sure you see that in your own work with, you know, working on others that, a lot of times people don't keep their energy field clear. They don't even know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And the, the hazards of being, you know, someone out there in the world who wants to do this type of work, um, it, it, it can really, you know, it can really backfire and people can have big problems. And would so you like I, to elaborate on that a little bit, maybe for our listeners who are wondering what that means? I know what that means, but I don't want to assume that other yeah, our to, listeners well, to, hopefully to inspire your listeners, you know, if you're really aspiring to be a healer, you know, get a teacher and stick with that teacher. Find someone that you feel has integrity and, you know, to, they're truthful and, you know, all of the things that one wants, to, a person wants to have when finding that person to study with, because, you know, in, in this industry, there's a lot of wounded healers and there's a lot of people out there practicing 
who um, they don't keep their filters clear. They are drinking alcohol. They are using drugs. They are smoking pot. They are, you know, doing whatever. And it's clogging up their field. It's clogging up their filters. So then when they view the person and let's say they're doing long distance healing, they're, they're not looking through clear filters. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, their filters are mucked up. So I, I just, I want to, you know, sort of set the bar at a place for your listeners that I feel this is very important that we, we cannot step on that path of being a healer without taking full responsibility for our instrument. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you mm -hmm. for saying that too. Yeah. Um, well, and if you don't mind, maybe we'll kind of do this this conversation a little bit backwards because usually we start mm -hmm. with the book, but maybe we'll end with the book. So as we're on the topic of, you know, healing and from a distance, um, I had said to you before we started recording that we've never really talked to anyone that um, does energy surgery. I have heard of it before, um, but how do you help people to restructure their tissue, repair their organs? I mean, that might sound really just, whoa, how is that even mm -hmm. possible um, to some of our listeners? Can you describe that a little bit and what an energy surgeon actually does? Well, you know, without going into this, like I'm going to start training everybody in this interview, <laughs> which, you know, is totally impossible. But to describe more of what I would do, like if you called me and said, Sonia, I've got a, a lesion on my liver. Can you help me? I would go in and literally repair the tissue you know, stitch it up. I would do, you know, basically a surgery, um, but I'm working on that person at a distance and I'm working energetically in, in their physical body and in their field. So um, I guess it may be another way of putting it is if someone calls me with a heart problem and I look in the heart and I see that <clears throat> there's some blockage or there's a, an artery that's actually starting to kind of fold in a little bit. I'll go in and I'll put an energetic stint in and, you know, the blood flow is better. Everything's working better. You know, I've got, I have a, I have a cardiologist in New York city who refers people to me, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, it's, I don't, it's something that I feel has taken years of working with people hands-on to be able to hone that skill. And one of the most important things I feel to doing any kind of healing work or just being alive on earth um, has to do with being grounded and really understanding that our energy is meant to be connected to the earth, not so much each other, that we're really supposed to be grounding our energy deep into the earth. And to bring the book into this, Dancing with Raven and Bear, would you mind if I read the 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 the, the story on grounding? Yes, please in, do. In my book, I think it would really add to what I'm talking about. <clears throat> there's a picture. Um, all the artwork in the book is my my artwork, and there's a picture of a woman sitting holding ravens, and the caption says she sat with her ravens, contemplating her next move. She was grounded. She was content. She was free. There was a girl who sat in meditation for a lo for long. Sorry, there was a girl who sat in meditation for so long. Her hair grew into a raven. Her mind released all that she was attached to, and she began to feel peaceful. As she let things go, her body relaxed, and the raven on her head called out to his friends. They sat in her lap and had a noisy talk. They discussed the weather and the latest news. It was so loud, she felt the noise dissolve into nothing. She could feel her body was no more. The birds were weightless in her arms. Her energy started to dissolve and merge with the ravens in the air around her, joining with all that was. The ravens grew quiet and whispered in her ear, be free, little one allow yourself to be free. She felt a deep peace that was indescribable and encompassed all that she was and all that she knew. She felt wings sprout out of her back and her body changed. Feathers emerged and a large beak formed where her mouth was. 
she took flight with the other birds and realized her human form was not who she really was. So that's out of Dancing with Raven and Bear. And I think it's really a, a great example, you know, for people to understand that once we're grounded and connected with the earth, we really do connect with much more of who we are and what our purpose is. And can you explain for our listeners, too, what the story is behind Raven and Bear for you? Well, Raven and Bear are two really powerful, you know, characters in my life. Um, you know, my Norwegian heritage, my native heritage, you know, there's always, I've been drawing since I was a kid and I always drew ravens. I, I had ravens in every picture that I ever drew and every painting I ever painted. And they were quite influential. And then I learned about, you know, Odin's ravens, Hugin and Munin. And, you know, I started to connect, oh, this is my Norse mythology coming through. And, you know, my native, my native mythology, you know, bear and always being connected to bear. So these characters have been with me my whole life. And, and, you know, I gave them voice, but these stories are original stories. They came very much through me in a, uh, I, you know, in a state of being connected and <laughs> it's hard not to live any part of my life, not connected. Um, and I, you know, I, I, um, I felt like it was a way for me to share things with my clients that sometimes when I'm in sessions with people, I experience their resistance. Like they don't want to go there. There's something that's a block that they're resisting. And this was my way of, of storytelling of saying, okay, let's approach these different topics and go in from a different angle. Let's go into grounding or releasing pain, power, dreaming, death, the illusion, love, you know, mending a broken heart. Let's go into some of these areas through Raven and Bear, through storytelling, so that I could maybe access and reach that person in a different way. And can you also describe maybe a little bit, because you mentioned it in your book, how sometimes people can look at ravens as being, you know, an omen or they're the messengers, the tricksters in one of the mythologies. Um, and mm -hmm. but can you talk about what does what do these animals bring as their message to people and just the spirit that they that they hold? As well, I, I think I think the raven is is very much a trickster, a uh, um, a, a, a bird that has sort of that, I'm going to help you, but I may help you through adversity. I may, I may show you the other side of it so that you learn something. Whereas bear is the healer. Bear is the one that comes in and really like I have bear uh, as a medicine man in the book because bear traditionally in my Hopi culture, they're the healers. And another question that I had for you too, or maybe it's, maybe it's more of a comment, but when I was thinking about the Raven, I have um, a divination card deck. And mm -hmm. in that deck, the Raven talks about the dark aspects of our life, but how things need to sometimes go through a period of destruction before they can be reconstructed. And it mm -hmm. talks about in, in darkness, there is light and in light, there is darkness. And it's about, um, like the death of one thing brings the birth of another and not something right. to be afraid of or fearful of, um, but really more to embrace the change, kind of the duality of life, the death and the birth. Right. Right. I think that's great. I think that's a great explanation. I take it a little bit further because of, of, you know, the understanding that I have of Hugin and Munin, Odin's ravens. They represent his eyes and ears of what's going on in all the nine realms. And they fly through all the nine realms, gathering information and bringing it back to Odin so he knows what's going on. And I tend to look at Raven in that way. I, I see Raven as being a messenger, so, you know, a, a being who's going to go out and gather some kind of information and bring it back. Now, that, that, that delivery of that message may come through some form of 
you know, um, adversity or, 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 you know, being the trickster presenting something, you know, that is sort of like you're, you know, you're, you're having to confront that shadow side. You're having to look into that shadow side and go, oh, wow, this is a part of me. So I, Raven has a lot of compassion and a lot of love in my stories, but he's definitely the one that, you know, wants to chime in and tell Bear, I told you so, I told you so. <laughs> so, Great. yeah. Thank you. I was also wondering, um, you know, because I, I live in New York, I'm born in New York. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I was reading a part of the story about you living in New York City after 9-11 and how that there were so many energies um, that you had to contend with <clears throat> when you would walk near the World Trade Center. And there are people in my life who have been affected by that. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just um, going into that a little bit more. Well, I, I you know, I... Found, I love New York. I, I've actually lived in New York two different times in my life. And I trained, uh, you know, as a ballerina when I was young in New York. And then I moved back with my husband during the time <clears throat> that I wrote about in the book. And I, f I find that um, there are so many layers of energy that's sort of stored in the in the, the grid system of New York itself that, you know, I, I've, I had to sort of contend with that and work with that. I did the work that I do more as a visionary. I worked for a large corporation and would look into mergers and partnerships and all kinds of things. And it was in the financial industry and it was, um, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty eye opening because, um, there's a lot of large companies out there in the world that are using black magic and voodoo and all kinds of stuff to, manipulate and alter what's going on and getting people to sign on the dotted line, et cetera. And I, um, you know, that was a real, that was a real wake up call for me. I, I remember looking at one particular bank and I could see, you know, all the people in the bank and they all had a reptilian inside of them. Reptilians for your listeners are a, an alien species that have been here on earth for a long time and very much vying for the power of this planet wanting to be in charge. And there was a reptilian in each one of these people. <laughs> and I, I remember looking at it and they all looked at me and I was like, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I was like, I was like the lion in the wizard of Oz running down the long hallway and jumping out the window. <laughs> ah, you know, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was a real wake up call there. There's a lot of things that are going on, even in, you know, corporate America that we might not think of, but, you know, it, it's happening. Right. And I know you're saying, too, um, in that part of the book that you also helped a lot of people um, to the light that were that were stuck in the energy of New York City. Yeah, I did. I, I actually have a client who worked on the rebuild of that site. And he called me often and said, okay, so everybody's spooked, all the guys, nobody wants to work because there's something going on here. And I would go in and clear it. And usually it was, you know, people that were still stuck, uh, souls that still had not, you know, been able to make that transition. And sometimes that is really the path of that soul. You know, there's people who die that, that stay in sort of this earth plane because they're, they're serving a purpose. They're reminding us, you know, don't go near the rocks. You could crash. You know, they're, they're serving a purpose. But some souls are stuck and they do need help to the light. Um, I, I never make that call myself. That is something that I always ask the angels, you know, and creator to help with. Um, I think when we get into trouble as healers or visionaries is when we start thinking that we know what's best. It's our will. And it's never our will. It's, it's creator's will. It's, it's the goddess. It's the earth. It's, it's a much higher power. 
Yes, I, w- I would agree. And this kind of leads into one of my next questions. And um, your chapter 13 is about love. And there was uh, this beautiful thing that I was reading that I wanted to talk about that you had said, when I talk to people on the other side who have passed away, they often tell me their conversation with creator is not about what they accomplished in life, but rather how much they loved and were loved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, as I read that and, um, you know, I thought, what if, what if everyone really took that to heart, you know, listening, mm-hmm. listening to this podcast and just thought for a moment, if you knew that when you passed, what was most important, important was how much you loved and how much you were loved, would mm-hmm. people's goals change in life? You know, if you knew, if there was a prize for loving, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, or, you know, the evolution of their, of their own consciousness. But to me, just even in reading that was just a beautiful reminder too of not to get so wrapped up in all of these goals that we're trying right. to set or where the heck are we trying to get really right you know or right. what are we accomplishing why are we working so hard and going putting ourselves through so much stress to reach these goals or this these financial yeah. goals and um it was just you know reading that you have i always have moments in a book that just soften my heart and bring me back, you know, mm-hmm, to like, mm-hmm. yes, this is, this is what it's about. That's so cool. I was, I was wondering, you know, if you can talk a little bit more about that and, and how often that is a message when you are speaking to those who have already passed, uh, mm-hmm. about that message that they give to you that you can give to others. Well, the, the, the first book that I wrote is called angels in the 21st century. Um, a book, on, uh, it's a book on death and dying. And really it's like a little handbook that you can, if you're sitting in the hospital, you know, we're trying to cope with someone passing. It's a great book, you know, and it's a lot about what my clients have said, you know, that they, they went through this or they have questions about death and dying. Anyways, in that book, I write the mission statement for humanity, which is we are here to love at the deepest level of our being. And, and, you know, I totally understand that because, again, in what you just brought up, people coming to me, uh, this one gal called me and she said, my father and I had a pact that when he died, I would speak to someone, you, and, and he would come through and, you know, and give me a message. And I could see him. He was standing there playing his day. And he said, you know, he said, honey, I, I, I did have a review. I did make it, you know, to God. And I had a review, but the review wasn't what we thought it would be. It wasn't about my jobs and the accomplishments that I made in my life. He said it was about love, how much I loved. And he said, you know, I loved you and your mom and our dog. And he says, but I really excluded my love to you and mom and, and the dog. And he said, what I learned was that I was supposed to love everybody around the world as much as I love you and mom and the dog. And he said, I, 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 he said, I was just flabbergasted. You know, it was like, oh my God, I had, I had so kept my love contained for only this small group and it was supposed to go out to everyone. And from that session, which was years ago, you know, I, it, it impacted me so much that and I have heard this from other people as well that it really was it, it's not the review it's not about what you've done it's about how much you have loved and it 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 really changed me it really changed my love and that I you know am very free to give my love to everyone it's like I make that a goal every day you know I go out not to sound you know corny but you know, when I go out into the world, I'm shopping, I'm in the store. I really try to make contact with at least two or three people, you know, like walk by somebody. Wow, I really love your blouse. It's so pretty. You know, I really, you know, oh, you know, your your kids are so cute. You know, something that love, whatever. I'm not saying I love you to strangers, but I am sort of sending that message out through through making contact. I think it's important because honestly, if you asked me, Sonia, what do you think is lacking from people's lives the most? It's that people don't feel seen, they don't feel heard, and they don't feel loved. They don't feel appreciated. They don't feel valued. 
And all of that seen, heard, valued, you know, appreciated, that all comes under the header of love. They don't feel loved. Yeah. And I think what you're doing there, uh, the word that comes to my mind too, and you said it in so many words is that when you're, you know, saying, Oh, your kids are so cute. Or I love your blouse. Mm -hmm. You're noticing them. They're being noticed. Exactly. And that is so, so important. I mean, I just, my heart broke the other day when I, when I read an email from a client of mine who I was going to, I did a healing session on and she said, well, you know, I've stopped listening to coast to coast. She said, that's where she heard me on because, um, there's just so many people on there. So many light workers who just are so light and they have so much ability and they have so much, you know, she was just, it was like, she was, she was paralyzed by the people who had come on and spoken like me about my work and what I have done. And, and, you know, we can go into the psychology of what she said. We'll skip that part. But the point (laughs) is, you know, is it makes me sad that there is that competition, that line of why do you have all of this and I don't. And what I have to say about that, because I think this is a really good point, is honest to God, I would not wish my abilities and my life on anyone. I would not. As, As wonderful and glamorous as people may think it is, I spend every day clearing entities and aliens, removing implants out of people, um, getting attacked by aliens because I've removed implants, um, getting you know attacked by other people because of my abilities. I mean, I have seriously, my life is not a rosy picture here. I am dealing with the dark side all the time and clearing stuff out of people. And, you know, for those people listening who might think this is a really glamorous, wonderful, you know, isn't this great? No, it's not. It's very difficult. And and it takes the kind of, you know, dedication and and clarity, as I talked about earlier, and keeping, keeping my filters clear um, to deal with that. Mm-hmm. It really yeah. does, because it's 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 not, I mean, it's not fun. And and I thank you for saying that too, because I think where this is just my opinion, where people may think that it's fun or, whoa, that's so cool is they sometimes get wrapped up in the, maybe the all of the psychic ability, the, the ability to see, or that strong intuition or look at all that, you know, and you don't even know me, but how do you know all of that? Right. Right. But as you said, there comes a tremendous responsibility with doing mm-hmm. the work, you know, that huge, you're doing. Huge, huge responsibility. I mean, I have, I have people in my own industry, you know, who say, oh, I, I, I wish I could do what you do. And, you know, how come I can't do what you do? And, and right there off the, off the bat, it's like I'm clearly seeing that they're invested in that statement through their ego. So they haven't really contended with what their ego is sort of creating for them. And secondly, it's like, well, yeah, the reason you don't have this ability is because I know what you would do with it and it's not good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, it really does take, um, I mean, I find that it, this, it just, there's just so much, um, there's just so much integrity to me that, um, a person has to have in order to deal with that, that ability, power, energy, whatever gift, you know, whatever. And, and no, we're not all the same. We we are all spiritual beings. Yes. We all have a soul that has the God particle in it. Yes. And we all are connected to God, to source, to creator, to the earth. Yes. But we don't all have the same abilities. And You know, I have people who call me and say, well, you know, I talked to this person and they told me that this is what my last lifetimes were and this and this and this. And I always say to them, why would you assume that this person and myself are the same? We are not the same. They have their vision. I have my vision. And it's very different because we are at different stages of our karmic uh, uh, you know, our karmic road. We all are here because we're working through our karma. We're all trying to get our karma resolved. Karma to me is unresolved emotional wounds from past lives. 
So we have all these lifetimes, if you review, you know, human history of, of violence, of dying, really difficult deaths, dying in wars, killing people in wars. I mean, we've all gone through massive stuff in our past lives. And so here we are now in this lifetime going, okay, why aren't things working? How come I'm not getting the part that I wanted? How come I'm not getting the job I wanted? I want to be an actress. How come no one's hiring me? That's what I want. I did my vision board. How come it's not working? You know, and it's like, because we're, you have to deal with your karma. You have to look at what your past lives are, what they have been, what you incurred, what emotional wounds you've brought with you. And that's, that's the place to go. That's the, that's the important part of what we need to contend with, work on and heal, you know, but Pete, we we're so, like you said, we're so goal oriented. We're so competitive and we're so molded by what society says we're supposed to be. Right. Right. Exactly. And, uh, you know, and speaking about karma too, um, this ties in maybe to what we were talking about earlier, because something had come to my mind when we were talking about um, the energy surgery and that mm-hmm. you may be, you know, removing something or healing something on the liver. Is there anything involved, say, in our physical bodies when that stuff manifests? How do you know that <clears throat> by removing that it is not contributing to the karma that that person needs or a lesson that they need to learn. Like, let's say somebody gets diagnosed with, um, you know, liver cancer. And, but what, what if there was a lesson in that whole process? Um, and I'm sure you're going to say too, that you probably do need to ask a level of permission. Is this okay? Um, for it to be removed, but do we sometimes, you know, where's that ethical responsibility of the healer to also know when to not remove something or heal something because it may be in that person's best interest or karma to go through the lesson of what that could teach them? Exactly. It, 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 spot on. Yes, I'm applauding you. That's so important. And and here's here's the tricky part, okay? Humanity as a whole has the, you know, the innate, um, fight or flight <clears throat> amygdala part of the brain, the amygdala that, that we go into if we're dealing with an illness or some kind of scary situation and to tell someone on the phone, I'm sorry, it is your karmic path to deal with cancer. You're just going to have to go through this is not really what people want to hear. Right. 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 So my, you know, I only do the work when I'm guided by my guides who are high angelic beings. I ask permission of the higher self. I never work on anyone without permission. And I also feel that if the, if the cancer is stage four, and let's say my guides are saying, you know, this is really the path they're on. This is what they have to go through then I go into clearing, helping them and clearing what this is in their past lives, clearing it karmically so that they don't have to incur this again. So there are ways to approach that illness or that disease, whatever is going on, that gives some kind of relief to that person so that they're not suffering. I don't believe in suffering. I don't think anybody should suffer. Mm-hmm. You know, my God, we suffer as a species enough, right. you know, and we cause a lot of suffering. So, yes. um, so I really feel that it's about guidance. It's about, you know, as, as a healer being clear in, in all of my ability to give guidance and to receive that, you know, that information from my guides as to what is really needed. I'd also like to give you an opportunity, um, if you'd like to, because we've recently had quite a few <clears throat> researchers, um, experts in the field of um, UFOs and aliens mm-hmm. and things of that sort, but never, you're the first person probably since you've mentioned it, um, of a healer that is actually working with some of that energy. We've we actually just got back from Ithaca. We interviewed um, a man by the name of Peter Robbins um, in the UFO researching and um, mm-hmm. analysis and stuff like that. And we were, he was telling us some stories of implants and 
things of that sort, but we've never really had the opportunity to talk to a healer who's doing the work that you're doing and some of the things that probably you have experienced in this realm um, mm-hmm. with with extraterrestrials. So would you like mm-hmm. to talk at all oh, about yeah. that? Okay, that'd oh, be great. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm a guest speaker at a, um, a conference in Manchester, United Kingdom, uh, July 19th and 20th. It's called Awakening. Uh, it's a UFO uh, conference, conscious life UFO conference, and and you know my my experience uh, is is <clears throat> I talk a lot about this in my book called Spirit Traveler: Unlocking Ancient Mysteries and Secrets of Eight of the World's Great Historic Sites, and <clears throat> this um, this book is okay. Now we're going into sort of another. Area sure, of, of Sonia's Sonia stuff, but but I have the ability because I've told you I I defy time and space and how I work with people long distance. I also have the ability to time travel, and I've gone back to some of these sites like Stonehenge, you know, Tawanaku, Chichen Itza, you know, all over the world, um, and. And I'm shown, my guides take me, I don't go without them, and I don't go as in astral projecting. I literally go into meditation, and my body, I can't go anywhere until my body has dissolved. And my body dissolves into like, it's like grains of sand, it just, my body completely dissolves. And it's not until then that my guides hold their hands out, and then I go with them, and usually they take me where they want to show me something. So I, I don't just dial it up and go, hey, let's go to Peru. You know, <laughs> you know, it's like they are the ones that direct this. And in the course of time travel, I have not only been, uh, you know, in, introduced and communicated with demigods um, and the demigods who helped form and create these civilizations you know, 12,000 years ago, I have also had encounters with um, other parts of our society that's been, um, that's been influenced. Um, I, I see all levels of the astral plane. You know, I see demigods. I see the Norse gods. I see the Egyptian gods. I mean, I see all of it. I see you know, the aliens, which are more like greys and reptilians and, uh, you know, back in the day, the Anunnaki, um, you know, there's all kinds of alien beings. There's shadow aliens. There's, uh, you know, the, um, what are they called? Praying mantis. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of aliens. The difference between aliens and demigods, because demigods are star beings, is demigods are huge. They're like 12 to 16 feet high and they're benevolent beings. They're, they're right up there with angels. They're, they're very, very high benevolent beings. And uh, thus the term demigod, I mean, it's why we, the people have worshiped the demigods throughout, throughout our history here on earth. They ha- they are the ones that have come in and basically altered, changed, cross-pollinated with the human form to create all of these different cultures. So, so aliens like the greys, you know, they're, they're smarmy little spuds who, you know, want to, they've got an agenda. They want to implant, you know, and put implants in people and take tissue samples and basically, you know, hijack the human uh, cellular (laughs) DNA uh, you know, information so that they can create a new species. And there already are hybrid grays on the planet. Um, I have a lot of clients who have been abducted. I have my own experiences of, you know, working and seeing and interacting or basically just defending myself from a lot of alien species. And probably the, the most difficult uh, species that's coming through right now because we have all these portals opening up because we are in the fifth dimension now and a lot of new alien species are coming through is one in particular that's called they I call them shadow aliens and their agenda is to literally step into humans human into into bodies and take over because they don't like what we're doing with the planet and they have their own agenda 
And that's the thing about aliens. We, like humans, we have an agenda. They have an agenda too. You know, we put radio collars on bears and wolves and animals, and, you know, basically they do the same thing. It's a little more sophisticated. They put implants in people. And I'm not trying to scare your listeners, but I am trying to say that this has been going on for a long time. And we as a species, you know, humans, we need to really wake up to the fact that there is other life in the universe that's very much visiting and coming through here to Earth. I, in my book, Spirit Traveler, you know, talking to and learning why the pyramids, the Great Pyramids were built or you know, who built Tuanaku or why was Chichen Itza built? Um, you know, th that's really cool. And, and it's been really nice to get that information and, you know, communicate with these demigods. But as far as communicating with, you know, alien species, uh, -uh I don't. I clear that stuff. I get them out and I get the implants out. And is there is there any good intent? I mean, because it, it does sound like, you know, when you were talking about the grays and the implants and getting the DNA to create a new species, species mm -hmm. um, is, is there anything that could be good that comes of that? I think the good comes from the demigods. I think they're the ones that really have our best interest at heart and they want to see us thrive and grow and as a, because, you know, the human form is very young. We're like four year olds and the, and, and don't, and don't get that mixed up with the fact that our soul bodies, which inhabit the human form, our soul body is infinite. We have always been, we will always be. And we do return to God or to source because we have that particle of, you know, the God particle in our soul body. We do go to heaven, to the spirit realm. You know, we, we have our, our original state of being, which is our soul body. You know, th there we are. We're in our original state going, yeah, I feel good. You know, I'm totally immersed in divine love. But when we come back through into human form, um, it's difficult. It's a dense form. It's young. We have not, we're here as souls to evolve this race of beings. You know, meanwhile, out in the universe, other alien forms are developing and growing and evolving. The thing that makes us different than the grays and the reptilians and some of these alien species that we know about is, um, is we're handed a palette, like a painter's palette when we're born that has all the emotions on it. And we literally dip our brush in and paint our world each day. Oh, I feel happy. Oh, let me paint a little bit of uh, sadness, a little bit of resentment here. I'm kind of angry over here. We are painting our world every day with the vibration of emotion. And that's what's different. You know, people talk all the time about having been abducted by grays and that they don't have any emotion. There's no connection emotionally to anything of what's being done and what happened to that person. And that's what makes humans so unique and very much a desired species in the universe because we have the experience of emotion. But the emotions are the direct line. They're the threads that, that, are, that are our karma. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. We don't want to be creating more karma, but we are here in physical form and have to feel our feelings. So we shouldn't shut off our feelings, but we should feel them, process them, and release them back into the earth. Then, then we start to maybe lessen the amount of karma that we are incurring. Wow, very interesting. Yeah, makes a lot of sense when you tie it into that emotion, you know, mm -hmm. that you were talking about. I, um, Mike had recently sent me an article that was on Forbes uh, that was talking about, I don't know if it was a theory or somebody's theory or opinion about that really Earth is just an extraterrestrial zoo and mm -hmm. that the aliens have put us here and are testing us here. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, they just kind of threw us down to interact and, you know, when we start to get unruly or things of that sort, they'll shut certain things down or they'll mm -hmm. do this or that. Um, do you believe that we are separate from 
the aliens that were not just an experiment. I don't know if you have an opinion on it. I don't know if I have an opinion on it. It was just something that I just recently read that I thought, huh, that's interesting. Honestly, I I feel humans are as much extraterrestrials as extraterrestrials are. (laughs) And, and my, my research and, you know, all that I've looked into, um, I have learned that humans came to earth, the human form came to Earth 20 million years ago, and we came from a planet out in the universe that is the mathematical equation of zero. Zero is the only number in our system that is not in duality. So we actually came from a non-dualistic reality and were living in dualism as, as a form. And I, I, we don't have time to go into this, but a lot of what I teach is about learning not only how we engage our energy in duality, but how to step out of duality and simply observe it. And I believe that's where we're headed. I believe that we are actually headed because we're in the fifth dimension now. We're headed into a non-dualistic reality. And that's why we're watching things get really extreme. You know, the good is really good and the bad is really bad. And it's like super, super extreme. And it's, it's in my studies, it's, it's to me, it's splitting apart. We are really watching duality change and split apart. And we are eventually going to have to return to relying on that inner compass that's in our soul body. And that's why I say to people, I post all the time on Instagram and Facebook, you know, the hashtag do the work, you know, it's an inside job. We have to go in now and excavate those emotional wounds so that we can be ready to, to not only be a part of this fifth dimension that we're in vibrationally, but to also rely and trust on what is right and wrong, good and bad within us that we're not looking outside of ourselves for that. And I swear you and I did not talk before this podcast or have anything planned. We did not. But this is it's so, so funny, crazy, not crazy. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. the way that I wanted to, what I was thinking of a way to end um, our conversation <laughs> as we are coming to this was one of the last things that I highlighted on in your book on page 128. <laughs> and, um, it ties so beautifully in to what you were talking about, about mm-hmm. observing the, the non-duality. And I'd like to read it for our listeners mm-hmm. um, because, again, this was another thing that really touched me in the book. And... Um, Sonia writes, being a spiritual warrior is not an easy task. Your integrity must be of high and your ego in such a state of balance that you are okay having nothing, being nothing, and not expecting anything. Sit in meditation and allow yourself to feel those feelings. If your fear comes up, observe it. Feel it and release it into the earth. If you feel combative and want to hang on to your title or position in life, then you know your ego remains invested in what you are doing let it go. When we truly embrace that we are infinite souls having a human experience, then our ability to dedicate ourselves to a life of service as a spiritual warrior is possible. I'm going to continue to read because there's a few more lines that I really like to make your daily practice one of forgiveness of yourself and others, align your spiritual practice with creator and the earth, tell your story to the earth, sharing your feelings with her as you would another person, Surrender your attachment to things, people, and titles. Live in a state of nothingness so you can truly experience everything. And I like what you said. If if we do come from this planet or this planet zero, uh-huh. you know, living in that state of nothingness, when you think of zero, it has no duality. That may be what we always hear about returning home, returning uh-huh. home to yourself, returning back to that planet that is within of of nothingness of that, Mm -hmm. of what you were saying. Absolutely. And I do feel that every one of us as souls, we all have a home planet. We all come from different parts of the galaxy and beyond. I, I, I really see that when I go back and do past life readings and I get back to when a person first incarnated to earth, I'm shown where they came from before that, where their home planet is. But the human body, the human species itself came from that 
planet that, that I said the mathematical equation is zero. That, that's where this species came from. We're just as souls a, a part of the evolutionary process of this physical form. And, you know, we've, we've evolved. I mean, we've come through lifetime after lifetime with a new body, you know, different gender, different part of the world, and, and had another crack at it. <laughs> and now, now we're all, you know, it's kind of like we're rushing for the finish line, like, hurry, hurry, I got to get my spiritual groove on because, you know, I partied too much in the last lifetime <laughs> or the last five lifetimes. You know, it's like we really get a state of amnesia when we come through, so we forget that we have to do the work and really get into uh, clearing our karma and evolving this human race. Wow, what a wonderful conversation. Thank yeah, you. Thank yeah. you. This yeah, is wonderful. It's been we t- great talking with you. Yeah, we touched on so many different things. I didn't even know we were going to, but uh, mm-hmm. filled my soul. So, Sonia, thank, thank you. you so much. And um, for our listeners, uh, for more information about her workshops, retreats, how you can purchase a session with her, please go to soniagrace.com. That's spelled S O N J A G R A C E.com. Sonia, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Path 11 podcast today. I hope you all enjoyed this show. And if you haven't checked out our Patreon page, I'd like you to do so because we are going to start putting some content over there that is only for our Patreon subscribers. You can get content for as little as donating a dollar a month, and it could just be a one-time donation. We have other freebies over there that you can get depending upon how much you would like to donate. And again, it could be a one-time donation, or you can continue to keep your subscription on a monthly basis at that donation level, but I just put my MBT immersive experience, which was a four day, four day intensive meditation training in Tennessee with physicist Tom Campbell. I was listening to binaural beats, going to altered states of consciousness, having out of body experiences and life changing experiences that I was able to bring back, uh, for myself, for my clients, for my friends that was just out of this world. So if you would like to listen to that, I'd like you to head on over to path11podcast.com. You're going to see an orange button that says Patreon. Become a Patreon today and you can have access to that podcast. And I would like to remind you to head on over to path11productions.com and check out the membership that we have for the Afterlife Awareness Conference. We have over 25 hours of footage with amazing speakers like William Buhlman, Thomas John, Terry Daniel, Suzanne Geisman, Suzanne Northrup, Linda Fitch, uh, Austin Wells, just a few people Uh, to name off that were amazing. These workshops are just so valuable. So I think that you would really enjoy it. It's also a great thing to think about to maybe give the gift to somebody who is struggling with grief. If you are looking for resources, this is a great conference to send people to to check out. And thanks again for listening today. (laughs) 